Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for coming this evening. I'm happy to be here on my first visit to Perth. But if I, I come, not for the sunshine, because there's much more sunshine in India. <laughs> but I'll come because of all of you.
ओम ज्ञान तिरांतराजनशलाकय चक्षुन्मील तस्म श्रीगुरव नम श्रीचैतन्यमनोभ स्थापित येन भूतले स्वयं रूप कदा मह्यम ददा स्वदाक वंदेहुर श्रीयुतपदकमल श्रीगुरून वैष्णवांश श्रीरूपम साक्रजात सह गण रघुनाथाद तम सजीव साइत सवधूत परजन सहित कृष्ण चैतन्यदेव श्रीराधाकृष्णपा सह गण ललिता श्री विशाखाता नम ओं विष्णुपादा कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नमस्ते सारस्वते देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातारिणे वाछाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पति पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधर श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Hare Krishna Hare Krishna I'm very happy to be amongst all of you this evening Although I would begin by begging to differ with Muralidhar Prabhu not in principle of philosophy He quoted a verse from the Bhagavatam and I fully agree with that but it has nothing to do with me <laughs> <laughs> He talked about how saintly people go everywhere and make every place a place of pilgrimage. So the Siddhanta is right. So philosophically, it is perfect. But we have to see the application to the time, place, circumstance, and person. In any case, which reminds me that. Krishna consciousness is such a wonderful process that actually it doesn't depend on time, place, circumstance, and person. Anyone, at any stage of life, in any place, and in any circumstance, should do, must do, and can do Krishna consciousness. In every other Uh, aspect of life there is a consideration of time and place and circumstance for example working hours you go to your office there are timings you go from this time to this time you have a shift <coughs> or for food there is a time you are supposed to eat according to medical science ayurveda you have to eat at certain times sleep at certain times everything has time place and so similarly you have to eat at a certain place i see in western countries people walking and eating on the streets <laughs> not a good habit not a good idea so for eating there are rules when we should eat how we should eat etc for krishna consciousness you can and should do it anywhere everywhere in all circumstances which reminds me of a little story that Srila Prabhupada used to narrate 
And that story was connected to this particular verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. Narayana Paraha Sarve Na Kutaschana Vibhyati Svarga Pavarga Narkesh Vapitulyata Darshinaha It is a verse spoken by Lord Shiva to Mother Parvati when she had cursed King Chitraketu to be born as an Asura, as a demon, because he had apparently insulted or offended Lord Shiva. Because Lord Shiva had been sitting in the midst of renunciants and he was sitting with Parvati Devi, his wife, on his lap. And he was speaking to renunciants. See the irony of the whole situation. First of all, Shiva, Lord Shiva is a Grihastha. And he's speaking to renunciants. And when he's doing that, he's sitting in close proximity to his wife. Now the renunciants have no problem with that. Because they know how exalted Lord Shiva is. They know he is completely transcendent. They also know how exalted and glorious Mother Parvati is. So they have no issue. And they are listening very attentively to Lord Shiva expounding on the virtues of so many things of spiritual life, renunciation. And Chitraketu Maharaj happens to fly by and he sees this most astonishing event and scene that is there. How, how is this happening? And in his appreciation for Lord Shiva, thinking this can happen only with Lord Shiva. Imagine any other person doing this, no renunciate will sit and hear a lecture from him. But here is Lord Shiva and all these renunciants, experienced renunciants are hearing him with such rapt attention and with so much respect. So how glorious is Lord Shiva? So when he first saw that scene, he just burst out into laughter in astonishment and appreciation, not with the idea of making fun of Lord Shiva. Somehow or the other, by the arrangement of providence, by the Lord's own desire, because he had a purpose to fulfill in some past times to execute. So Par Mother Parvati, she thought that King Chitraketu was making fun of her husband. And she was laugh he was laughing at her husband. So she became annoyed and she cursed him that he would become a demon. Now King Chitraketu was an exalted devotee of the Lord himself. So when he heard this curse, not from any ordinary person, but from none other than Mother Parvati, mm -hmm. he understood this is something special. It's not an ordinary curse. And he did not respond. <coughs> he did not try to curse her back. Or he did not even try to justify his action or did not try to defend himself by saying, actually, you're mistaken. I wasn't laughing at Lord Shiva. Somehow or the other, I was just so astonished at his glory by seeing this that I burst out into laughter. He did not try to justify any of his actions. He just understood this is the Lord's desire. So he bowed his head at Mother Parvati's feet and said, Oh Mother, thank you very much. It is your kind mercy upon me. And he spoke in this way to her. And she was flabbergasted because normally when she would, if she, anyone is cursed like that, they will try to curse back or they will get angry or they will try to justify or defend their actions. But King Chitraketu was just so humble. He just bowed his head down and accepted it. And he was a great king. So she was taken aback. And Chitraketu Maharaj left. Then looking at her bewildered face, Lord Shiva smiled. And he said, this is the glory of the devotees of the Lord, of the Vaishnavas. This is how glorious they are. That they are so humble by nature that even if someone speaks harshly to them, curses them, offends them, 
they do not reciprocate in the same measure. They understand this is the Lord's will. And then he quoted the verse that I just quoted, where this verse means Narayana Paraha. Those who are devoted to Lord Narayan or Lord Krishna, survey all of them. Na kutaschana bhigyati. They are not afraid in any circumstance. Swarga, apavarga, narakeshu. Neither in swarga, that is in heaven, neither in apavarga, which means in the state of liberation from this material bondage, <coughs> or narakeshu, in the hellish planets. Apitulyata darshinaha. They see all these three conditions equally and they are not afraid, they are not disturbed. Wherever they may be, they will only do Krishna consciousness. They will exhibit their glorious Vaishnava qualities in all circumstances of life. So Srila Prabhupada gave the example of an agricultural implement that was used in India, especially in Bengal. It was called a dheki that was meant to thresh grains to remove the shaft from the grains. And he said there is a proverb in Bengali which means that if a dheki is shifted to swarga, to the heavenly planets, it will still only thresh grains. It's not going to be something different because that's, that's the purpose of the dheki. So you shift it to any other part, but it's going to do its job. So similarly, the devotees of the Lord, wherever they are in any circumstance, they will do what they're supposed to do. They will do Krishna consciousness. And then he narrated a little story, a humorous little story, which I'm, I think many of you may have heard. Once upon a time, there was this sadhu, this saintly person, who was sitting at a particular place, surrounded by some of his disciples. And they were having a discussion. <coughs> at that time, uh, a prince happened to be riding by on the horse. So, when the prince saw the saintly person sitting with his disciples, he thought it fit to get down, dismount from his horse, and to offer respects to the sadhu and to get his blessings. So he got down from the horse, he offered his respects to the saintly person and said, please give me your blessings. So the saintly person looked at him, here was this prince who had come, and he said, Rajaputra Chiranjivi. Rajaputra <coughs> means a prince. Chiranjivi, may you live long. And the prince was happy at this blessing and he went away. After some time, there was uh, a butcher who came along. Now this butcher being, you know, someone who was accustomed to cutting animals and so on, and it was very obvious that he was a butcher. His body was smeared with blood and, you know, so on. So he saw that was the culture, even a butcher would, would have some respect for a saintly person. So he came up, he saw the uh, saintly person, came, please give me your blessings. So then the uh, saintly person blessed him. He said, Jiva <coughs> Marova. No, no, Ma Jiva Ma Mara, he said. You don't live, you don't die. So the disciples got a little puzzled. What kind of blessing is that? You're not able to understand it. But they kept quiet. Then soon a brahmachari came along. And brahmachari was there, he also saw the saintly person. So he came to offer his blessing and to offer his respects. He asked for blessings. So the sadhu saw him and said, Ah, here is a, a brahmachari. He said, Brahmachari, he said, Ma Jiva, don't live. Which means die. Now the disciples were getting really puzzled. What? We just can't understand what our Guru Maharaj is saying. 
what kind of what kind of blessings are these? We are little puzzled. And then after that, a very special person came. There was a devotee from Perth. <laughs> <laughs> and this devotee he was a very devoted person. He was chanting Hare Krishna and he was walking along, singing, dancing as he was going. And because all the devotees from Perth are very humble <coughs> and very devoted by nature, very respectful to all saintly persons, as soon as he saw this saintly person, he immediately came and offered his respects, said, please offer your blessings. And the saintly person said, Jehovah Maruva. You may either live or you may die. And then the devotee went back to birth. He had come for some preaching engagement. <laughs> so by this time, the disciples were besides themselves with curiosity. They were impatient. He said, Guru Maharaj, please reveal the secret to us. What is the, what is the mystery behind these, <coughs> these types of blessings that we are given? We just can't understand. For, this, for the prince, you said, uh, you know, uh, Raja Putra Chiranjivi, may you live forever. And for the Brahmachari, you said, Majiva, you don't live, that means you die. We don't understand this. So he said, okay, I'll explain. He said that, you see, for the king or the prince, he has become a prince because of pious activities that he has performed in the previous life. As a result of this piety, he is able to enjoy opulence. And he is using this opulence for sense gratification, for enjoying the world. Now, because he is doing so much sense gratification, his destination will be hell. He will have to get the reactions to all the sinful activities that he is doing as a prince. So therefore, I am saying you live long, so that your... your uh, Transfer to hell would be delayed as much as possible. So at least you can stay on and on and here and then. <laughs> the last possible moment you go on to hell. But so long as you are here, at least you are enjoying the fruits of your pious activities of the previous life. <coughs> but then Guru Maharaj, why did you ask the Brahmachari, that you bless the Brahmachari that don't let the die? He's such an austere young Brahmachari. Did he deserve to be cursed like this? It was a blessing or a curse? He said it was a blessing. How is that? He said, see, this Brahmachari is so austere. He's taking on so many difficulties, physical pain, enduring, rising early in the morning, whole day is busy, living on a very frugal diet, very simple life. So he's so pure. What is the need for him to live here in this material world? and suffer. Oh. So better, he go, when he dies, he'll go back to the spiritual world. He'll get liberated. So I told him, anyway, don't worry. You die so that your austerity will end and you'll go back to, you'll get liberated and go back to the spiritual planets. But the butcher, what about the butcher? He said to the butcher, blessed him, don't live, don't die. Majiva, Mamara. Why is that? He said, look, this butcher is performing many sinful activities because he's killing animals every day. And therefore his destination is assured. He is going to hell. At the same time, therefore I said, Mamara, don't die. Because if you die, you'll go to hell. At the same time, because he's cutting animals now, all the time his you know, he's surrounded by these screenings, animals, there's pain, there's blood, there's flesh everywhere, all around. It's a living hell. So he's already living in hell. Therefore, I told him, Ma Jeeva, don't live. So don't live, don't die. That is the predicament or the condition of uh, the butcher. Then what about that devotee from Perth? <laughs> ah, now we are talking of something special. Why didn't you bless the Brahmachari? You go to, you know, you'll go back to the spiritual world. Why didn't you bless the devotee from birth like that? 
So then the sadhu replied, he said, See, devotees of Lord Krishna, and especially those who come from birth, <laughs> they are so committed, they are so dedicated to serving Krishna and to preaching Krishna consciousness everywhere. Wherever they go, they'll be doing this. They'll just be chanting Hare Krishna and speaking about Krishna. So for such devotees, it doesn't matter where they are. Whether they are in the heavenly planets, whether they are in the hellish planets, whether they are living in Perth or in Sydney or in Timbuktu or anywhere, wherever they may be, they will be chanting Hare Krishna. And they will be serving each other and, and praising, glorying, glorifying Lord Krishna. Even if they go back to the spiritual world, they do the same thing. So for devotees like that, it doesn't make a difference where they are. Because wherever they are, they will be doing just Krishna Consciousness. So in this way, Srila Prabhupada explained how uh, for devotees, it really doesn't matter the physical location, whether you are in Perth or this place or that place, you, your business is the same. So you will chant Hare Krishna, you will serve Krishna, you will worship the deity, whatever kinds of services are possible, we will do. So this is to illustrate that Krishna Consciousness can be done in any place, anywhere in the whole creation. In fact, there, there are some places that are more favorable, especially Perth, <laughs> <laughs> because a nice association of devotees. <laughs> but there are some which are special, like Mayapur, Vrindavan, the holy places where you do Krishna Consciousness, there is greater benefit. But still, <coughs> Because on the earth planet, there is so much opportunity and there is such a favorable situation, environment to do Krishna Consciousness, even the residents of the higher planets want to take birth to uh, on here on earth, especially in birth. <laughs> <laughs> because they know there is such a nice devotional environment. Why is that so? Because in the heavenly planets, there's so much enjoyment, you can't remember Krishna. In the hellish planets, there's so much suffering, you can't remember Krishna. But in the earth, and especially on earth, <laughs> everything is just balanced. There is suffering, there has to be, the material. But it's balanced, neither too much nor too little. So this balanced situation is perfect for doing Krishna Consciousness. So therefore the residents of the higher planets also desire to aspire to take birth here. Because even though Krishna Consciousness can be done everywhere in the universe, and it is done like that, but this earth planet represents a very favorable situation. And actually Srila Prabhupada said that wherever we have our temples, our temples are the spiritual world. <coughs> he distinguished between places in the mode of ignorance, places, places in the mode of passion, goodness, etc. For example, uh, a pub is a place in the mode of ignorance. A city, a busy, bustling city where people are running here and there for so many things, it's in the mode of passion. The countryside, the forest area, that's in the mode of goodness. And the temple of Lord Krishna is transcendental. So wherever there is a transcendental place like that, that's the place of pilgrimage. That is a holy place. This afternoon I was chatting with some devotees and I was asking what should I speak on. And somebody said, well, one of the topics we had discussed was making your home a temple. Then the thought came to me, well, making your home a temple is certainly very important. Everybody should do that. But also you should make the temple your home. <laughs> right? You should have ownership of the temple in the sense that, yes, it's my temple and we must help it to grow. This was Prabhupada's model. He wanted everybody to come together and form one nice devotee community, not considering any material designations, no uh, economic status, who is rich, who is poor, doesn't matter. 
social classifications don't matter. Who's from this community, who's from that community, who speaks what language, who's from which country, not, doesn't matter at all. Everyone should come together considering this is Lord Krishna's home and therefore it's my home. And we serve Lord Krishna with our full heart, with enthusiasm, with cooperation, with humility. And then Krishna will be very pleased. So the temples of Lord Krishna, and especially the ones established by in our International Society for Krishna Consciousness, they are very potent places for hearing and chanting about Krishna. Even though we can and should do it everywhere, but the temples in particular, because there are deities there, the devotees come there, but Prabhupada is present there, so it's very important for us to be there and hear and chant about Krishna and, and serve Krishna in other ways. So this is as far as the different places are concerned. Even in terms of, of uh, situations of life, whether we do it in childhood, or in uh, youth, or middle age, or old age. Every stage of life is good for doing Krishna Consciousness. Of course, Prahlad Maharaj has said in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Kaumar Acharet Pradyam Dharman Bhagavatam Iha Durlabham Manusham Janma Tadapyantruvam Arthadam He says, my dear friends, he is preaching to his classmates, all five-year-old children. And he's telling them, my dear friends, one should start practicing this Bhagavat Dharma, this Dharma of devotion to the Supreme Lord, Bhagavan, Lord Krishna, <coughs> should be started from the age of five. Kaumar. Kaumar is when you, you're still young. And this is the highest dharma that everybody must do. This is the perfection of all knowledge. <coughs> so all of you must have heard this verse, Kaumaram Achare Pragyo. Any intelligent person must start early. Durlabham Manusham Jarma. Because this human species or the human form of life is so rare. Tad api adhruvam. And even though it is temporary, it lasts only for a few years, maybe 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. But Arthadam, it is very meaningful because it is the species of life which is most favorable for practicing and perfecting one's Krishna consciousness. We can do it in a demigod's body. We can even do it in an animal body. <coughs> Devotional service is so powerful. But the human form of life is most appropriate for practicing Krishna Consciousness. So this is the situation. So one should start young. So many times people say no, especially in India. Those of you who are from India, you must be familiar with this objection that many people raise. Oh, you are too young to do Krishna Consciousness seriously. First enjoy life. And then when you become very old, and brackets, which they don't say, and good for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and when you can't do anything else, then you come to Krishna. <laughs> so the best years of your life, you waste, you enjoy the senses, and when your body is good for nothing, then you come to Krishna and say, My dear Krishna, I am yours. <laughs> what is the use? It's like going to somebody's birthday or something, and offering a flower that is wilted and, you know, six months old or something. There is hardly anything left. And that person is actually going to feel offended. You know, this person, at least you should have got me one fresh flower. But you give a wilted flower, what is the use of that? That doesn't mean that if somebody is old, he shouldn't surrender to Krishna. If he or she hasn't done it before, better late than never. <laughs> but the point is, that one should not wait till old age to surrender to Krishna. One should start young. Catch him young is the same. So all ages of life are good. So in childhood, the examples, actually what to speak of childhood, even in the mother's womb, we have examples of King Parikshit, who became a devotee, had darshan of the Lord in his mother's womb. 
And also we know Dhruv uh, Prahlad Maharaj, he heard the Srimad Bhagavatam when he was in his mother's womb. His mother forgot, but he did not forget. And he remembered it even later. And then birth in childhood, we see Parikshit Maharaj and Uddhava, they used to play with dolls, Krishna, and they were practicing. And about Uddhava, Shukadev Goswami, or rather, um, mm. no, no, um, Shukadev Goswami says that he was such an exalted devotee that even as a child, when his mother called him for breakfast, he didn't come because he was so absorbed, not doing some frolicsome activity, but he was so busy serving Krishna that he didn't even want to take his meals, he didn't want to take prasadam. He was busy serving. So you see examples of uh, children <coughs> doing that. Then come to the age of five, you see devotees like Dhruva Maharaj, who surrendered to the Lord at the age of five. Then in youth, or in even young age, adolescence, we see the gopis of Vrindavan surrender to Krishna. When it comes to youth, we see Bharat Maharaj, the great king. He surrendered to Krishna and gave up his throne. When he was in the peak of health, when he was in the flush of youth, at that time he gave up everything and went to the forest to serve Krishna. In old age, we see King Dhritarashtra surrendered finally, finally surrendered. <laughs> And at the point of death, we see Ajamil surrendered. You see, so at any point in life, whether you're in the womb, in babyhood, in boyhood, or in youth, adolescence, middle age, old age, at the point of death, we should do Krishna consciousness. Whatever be the other facilities and circumstances, never mind. These circumstances are temporary. Everything in the world is temporary except Krishna consciousness. So we should not let the eternal function of the soul and our eternal duty go undone or be hampered because of some temporary duties which will keep coming one after the other, one after the other. Even at the point of death, in fact, that is what is essential. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Antakale chamam eva smaran muktva kalevaram eha prayati samad bhavam yati nastyatra sanshayaha. At the time of death, whoever remembers me will come back to me. That is Krishna's promise. Which reminds me of another story which I like to narrate in many places. It's a true story about a great devotee whose name was Gopal. And this Gopal one time observed that there was another devotee, older young, older man, and he was walking somewhere, but he was holding his tongue like this with his fingers. So young Gopal, who was only a small boy, he was curious to know why this devotee was doing such a strange thing, going somewhere and holding his tongue like that. So he asked him, why are you holding your tongue like this? He said, because I'm going to the toilet. He said, what does that have to do with it? So, I mean, why do you have to hold your tongue because you're going to the toilet? So he said, because I can't stop chanting the name of Krishna. Yes, so that's very nice. So why are you holding your tongue? He said, you see, because the toilet is an unclean place and you are going there to do an unclean activity and the name of Krishna is so pure. So how can I chant the pure name of Krishna in an impure place and at an impure time while doing an impure activity? <coughs> Therefore, I am holding my tongue because my tongue keeps on naturally resounding, vibrating the names of Krishna. So I want to stop that when I am in the toilet, so I am forcibly holding the tongue. So young Gopal corrected him. He said, this is wrong philosophy. He said, what if you were to die in the toilet? 
Krishna says in the Gita that when you die, you should think of me. So if you're in the toilet and uh, you die, you'll not be able to perfect your life. And moreover, the holy name of Krishna is transcendental, which means it is always pure. There is no consideration of time, place and circumstance. There is no consideration of material impurity or purity. So you should, can and should chant the name of Krishna anywhere and everywhere. Yes, we don't take the chanting beads into the toilet, but you can chant the holy names at any time, in all circumstances. So this devotee was very enlightened and impressed. And people especially like it when they are, when, you know, young children preach Krishna consciousness. It's very attractive. So this devotee then spread the word everywhere in Jagannath Puri. This incident happened in Jagannath Puri. He spread the word everywhere. And news reached the ears of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he became very happy. And then he said, he called Gopal. He said, Gopal, you have given all of us some very nice instructions in Krishna consciousness. And you therefore, you have become our Guru. <coughs> therefore, from today, your name shall be Gopal Guru. So all the assembled devotees cheered loudly, Hari Bol, Hari Bol. They became very happy to see his name changed to Gopal Guru. And another time what happened was that since we are on the topic of Gopal Guru, that there was a great devotee who was an associate of Lord Nityananda, whose name was Abhiram Thakur. He was a very powerful devotee. Powerful, I don't mean just physically, spiritually, very powerful. It was said that if he offered his obeisances to anybody who was not a genuinely pure Vaishnava, that person would die. <laughs> and sometimes he would offer his obeisances to Shalagram Shila, and if that was not a genuine Shalagram Shila, it would crack. The stone would crack. So Abhiram Thakur was in the business, was, sometimes he had this habit of testing devotees. <laughs> <laughs> so he had the glories of Lord Gopal. He said, let me offer obeisances to him and see how exalted he is. So word spread in Jagannath and all the devotees started getting worried for Gopal. He said, oh my God. Abhiram Thakur is coming with the idea of testing Gopal and he's going to offer obeisances to Gopal. Now what will happen? So then they all went to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu with complaints. Please do something to protect Gopal. He said, don't worry, don't worry. So he made Gopal sit on his lap. When Abhiram Gopal came and he offered respects, then nothing happened. Of course, because Gopal was already pure, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had personally given his protection to, Abira, to, to Gopal, to, to Gopal Guru. And Abhiram Gopal Thakur was also very happy. The same Gopal Guru went on to become a very famous sannyasi, Gopal Guru Goswami. And he became the head of the Radha Radha Kanta Mat, which also had the Gambhira, which is a place where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to stay when he lived in Jagannath Puri, and one room, Gambhira, that is in the premises of the Radha Radha Kanta Mat. So he was the Acharya of that Mat, Gopal Guru Goswami. So in any case, this is also an example of how even at the time of death, or even in any place, be it outside in a pure place, impure place, it doesn't matter, we should be Krishna conscious. How many of you do pujari services in the temple, Nivan? Pujari. So you chant one mantra, isn't it? Om Pavitra Pavitrova Sarvavastham Gatopiva Yes Marit Pundari Kaksham Sar Bahya Pyantar Shuchihi Bahya Pyantar Shuchihi This means that whether one has, whether one is in an impure condition or a pure condition, whether whatever be the place one has passed through before coming here, if one simply remembers the lotus-eyed Krishna, 
that one will remain always pure. It doesn't mean that one shouldn't take a bath or one shouldn't be clean. Of course one should. <laughs> but still, external purity or cleanliness is not enough. One must think of Krishna and chant Krishna's name to be always pure. So Krishna consciousness applies in all circumstances and all conditions of life. And the power of Krishna consciousness is such that not just should you chant at, uh, from, from the womb to the tomb, <coughs> but even at the tomb you should chant <laughs> as a body. That's why when a person is a devotee or anybody is being cremated, then everybody chants, or so is supposed to chant there. And rather than shedding tears and mourning and grieving, which makes the onward journey for the departed soul very difficult, one should actually chant the holy names. There was one great devotee and associate of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. His name was Saranga Thakur. And he was a very exalted soul. And many devotees became attracted to him and they wanted to take shelter of him. They wanted to be initiated by him. But he would refuse to initiate anyone. Finally, many did the news reached Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's ears that Saranga Thakur was refusing to initiate devotees when so many people wanted to take initiation from him. So one day Chaitanya Mahariya, Mahaprabhu had already told him earlier, he had hinted to him that you should initiate. But he wasn't doing it. Finally, Mahaprabhu told him a little sternly, I have already told you, you must initiate disciples. Why are you not doing it? Now, Saranga Thakur knew that he could not delay any longer. So it was already evening. He said, tomorrow, the first person I see, I'm going to initiate. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever it may be, I'll just initiate him. <laughs> So in the early morning, he went to the river Ganga to take a bath. And as it happened, somewhere upstream, there was a little boy who had died out of snake bite. Now the Vedic custom is that children below five years are not cremated. Normally people are, are the bodies are burned, <coughs> cremated. Except an evolved Paramhamsa or Sannyasi was placed in Samadhi, he is also not burnt. His body is not burnt. Uh, and little children, their bodies are not burnt. Either they, they are uh, buried or in some cases they are just led into the Ganga of the holy rivers. So what happened was that as Saranga Thakur went into the, ba to the Ganga to take a bath early in the morning, all of a sudden, as he emerged from the water, he saw this body of this child coming towards him and came very close to him. And so he initiated that <laughs> dead body. <laughs> and that dead body came to life. Yeah. And that devotee later became known as Thakur Murari, or Murari Thakur. Name was, he called him as Murari. And the word spread like anything, and the village in that happened is called Shava, which means corpse, dead body, because he initiated a corpse and brought him alive. So, by his powers, the soul that had left the body came back into the body. So, we can see Krishna consciousness even for dead body ages. But one who doesn't practice Krishna consciousness while living is as good as dead, even though living. So there is a verse, a nice verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam spoken by Mother Devahuti to her son, Lord Kapila. She says, Nehayat karma dharmaya, na vairagya upakalpate, na tirtapada seva yai, jivan napi vito hisa. She says, there are three categories of people who, even though living, are actually dead, as good as dead. What are those three categories of people? First is Nehayat Karma Dharmaya. People who work, perform karma, perform activities, but don't want to do any religious activity. 
They said, for me, just work, that's all. No religion for me. So such a person, Mother Devahuti said, is dead even though living. The second kind of person is one who performs religious activities dutifully but has not developed any sense of renunciation from this material world. No detachment is still very much attached, which means that this person performs religious activities for some material purpose. So no renun renunciation. So this person also, even though performing religious activities and living is as good as dead. The third category of person is one who is very renounced, has attained renunciation and detachment from this world. But, na tirthapada sevayai does not serve the Supreme Lord Krishna, who is called tirthapada. Tirthapada means at whose pada or at he, whose feet all the tirthas, all the holy places reside. So that's another name of Krishna. Because all the holy places reside at his lotus feet. So when you worship the lotus feet of Krishna, then you worship all the holy places. You needn't go to the holy places separately. <coughs> so, Mother Devahuti says that one who is renounced, but is not a devotee of the Lord, is also as good as dead, even though living. Jivan Napi, even though living, Mrita is dead, he is Saha, so that person is dead. So Krishna consciousness is life. This is the real life. So physical existence is not it. That's not the only thing. As Shukadeva Goswami says in the Srimad Bhagavatam, you know, doesn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the bellows of a blacksmith, they also produce air, they expel air. So our lungs are also expelling air, they inhale and expel air. So what's the, what's the difference between us and the bellows of a blacksmith? Because if it's just a question of living, inhaling and exhaling, <coughs> that the bellow also does. The difference is if we are devotees of Krishna, otherwise it's useless. So he gives many other examples like that. So the point being that it is only when we understand our constitutional position, we understand our real dharma, of surrendering to Krishna and becoming his pure devotees, that we actually start living. So till such time as one comes to Krishna consciousness, one has actually been like a corpse for millions of lifetimes. Living, yet not living. So now we are very fortunate that we have the opportunity to become devotees, and especially in birth. <laughs> <coughs> so we should take the full advantage of this opportunity and do our Krishna consciousness really nicely and live up to the meaning of the word life or living. We are living means we are Krishna conscious. So the degree that we are Krishna conscious, to that degree we are really living. Otherwise, everything else is a big zero. Thank you very much. And especially, I want to thank our host, Sahasra, who is our host, Sahasra. <laughs> I'd like to thank you and your family for hosting us today. And also, I'd like to thank all of you who have come here today, this evening, although it's a working day for this satsang. So thank you very much, Sri Lata Prabhupada Ki Jai Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Any questions, comments, differences of opinion? Yes. Why is it all is that? The 
Why do we take care of the body so much and the soul has passed away? For the last few months, Yes, uh, your question is why do we take care of the body so much, like going through the rites, the funeral rites, etc. Because the soul has lived in that body and we must dispose of the, that body has been a temple of the Lord. The Lord has lived in there as a super soul. So we have to dispose of that body in a decent and respectful way. Number one. Number two, when the soul leaves the body, then the attachment to the body still remains. And the attachment to the things connected with that body also remain. The subtle body which contains the mind, which has all these attachments and desires, wants to remain. But the laws of nature compel the soul to leave that body and go to another place. So when, you, when the body is burnt, then the connection of the subtle body and the soul to the gross body is severed. It's severed permanently. So then the uh, subtle body and the soul becomes free to just move on to the next destination. Otherwise there may be a tendency for the soul to hover around the place because of attachment. So therefore cremation is a very effective method of uh, performing the last rites. For one who is already a pure devotee, he doesn't need to be cremated, therefore is buried. Because already that soul has become detached from the body, from detached from the material world. So there is no need for the cremation ceremony. Okay? Any other question? Yes. So does that mean that when the Christians are don't cremate or they bury. It's not a good thing. Your question is that does it mean that when the body is buried and not cremated in order to cause another, it's not a good thing? From the Vedic point of view, we consider cremation as being a complete exercise. In burying, as I said, because unless the person is a self realized soul, there is always the possibility of the soul hovering around, lingering on there because of attachment. Therefore, crematoriums and burial grounds are always the are haunted places. <laughs> <laughs> Creepy places when you go there. Yes? How do you feel? Yes. Alright, the story that we married the Krishna Madhya from Chitraketu and Mother Parvati, mm. if I'm not wrong, I read in Bhagavatam that Chitraketu had actually power to destroy the Parvati, <coughs> but he didn't went that way. I think that was in commentary or I heard in lecture also by some Sanyasis. Um, but Mother Parvati appears to be seen the deep power in the whole material cosmology. Um, so, in order to accept our personal self, yes, Chitra Gopi's pure devotee is very powerful. But Mother Parvati, Parvati is Krishna, is her own external energy. Again, Bhagavata says that the Chitra Gopi is able to. He had power actually to come to act. But if she could even destroy power, how to accept this? The question is that in the story of King Chitraketu, it is said that King Chitraketu had the power to curse Mother Parvati again, which I mentioned in the court talk. What you're saying is that you read somewhere or heard somewhere that. <coughs> He had the power to even destroy Mother Bhagavati. Well, that is the exalted status of a great devotee. But the devotee never thinks like that. So he never what to speak of counter cursing Mother Parvati. He actually just took a humble position. So this incident 
has been orchestrated by the Lord Himself to illustrate the greatness of a devotee. How great and exalted is a devotee of the Lord. Parvati is also a devotee. But now she has been put into a certain situation by the Lord's arrangement where she uh, wrongly understood the motives of King Chitra Ketu. So we understand how glorious are the devotees. And Lord Shiva therefore spoke that verse. <coughs> okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gaur Premanande.